We're now broadcasting a classic production from the archives in which Ralph Richardson plays the storyteller and Scrooge with music composed by Christopher Whelan. A Christmas Carol. Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. But Scrooge never painted out his name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. And no man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Once upon a time, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, and the fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole. The door in Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that he put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle. Suddenly the street door opened and a cheerful voice, the voice of Scrooge's nephew, cried, A Merry Christmas, Uncle! Christmas? Bah! Humbug! Christmas a humbug? Oh, oh you don't mean that, I'm sure, Uncle. I do. Merry Christmas. What reason have you to be merry? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? Bah! Every idiot who goes about with merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. Come, Uncle, dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you damn first. But why? Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry for you, Uncle, with all my heart. But I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. A Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left, only stopping to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. And a very Merry Christmas to you too, sir. There's another fellow, Mike Clark, with 15 shillings a week, a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. Ha! <laughs> I'll retire to Bedlam. But this lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let someone else in. It was a portly gentleman, pleasant to behold, who now stood with his hat off in Scrooge's office. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. Seven years this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor? Both very busy, sir. I'm glad to hear it. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I've mentioned and those who are badly off must go there. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir. Seeing that it would be useless to pursue the matter further, 
the gentleman withdrew, and Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head. The cold became intense. The brightness of the shops, where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should. And even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. In the piercing, searching, biting cold, a boy stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized a ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool, and the expectant clerk in the tank snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, Cratchit. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound. It's only once a year, sir. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers, and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard where the fog and frost hung about the black old gateway. There was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door except that it was very large and Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. But when he put his key in the lock, he saw in the knocker Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by a breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it became a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation, would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key, turned it, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause, with a moment's irresolution, and he did look cautiously behind the door, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Oh, oh, and closed it with a bang which resounded through the house like thunder. He fastened the door, walked across the hall, and up the stairs, trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But this night, before he shut his own heavy door, 
he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. His glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell, that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound. But soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. They ceased as suddenly as they had begun, and were succeeded by a clanking noise, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the cellar, the door of which flew open with a booming sound. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door, then through the door and into the room. It was Marley. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, and with a kerchief bound around his head and chin. The chain he drew was long and wound about him like a tail was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. I won't believe it, said Scrooge to himself. And then, aloud, What do you want with me? But who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life I was Jacob Marley, your partner. Can you... can you sit down? I can. Do it, then. You don't believe in me. I don't. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees, clasping his hands before his face. Do you believe in me or not? I must, I must. You are fettered. Why? I wear the chain I forged in life. Is its pattern strange to you? Jacob, old oh, Jacob, Marley, oh, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge. But my time is nearly gone, hear me. I will, but don't be too hard on me, Jacob, pray. I am here to tell you, Ebenezer, that you have yet a chance of escaping my fate. You're always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank ye, thank ye. You will be haunted by three spirits. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. The second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night on the last stroke of twelve. Remember what has passed between us. The spectre took its wrapper from the table, bound it round its head as before, rose, wound its chain over its arm and walked backwards towards the window, which, at every step, raised itself a little 
so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, and of wailing inexpressibly sorrowful. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in a mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Desperate in his curiosity, Scrooge ran to the window. The air filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither, moaning as they went. Each one wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some were linked together, none were free. Their misery was that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded. And Scrooge, closing the window, examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, hum, uh, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotions he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was so dark that he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve. It was past two when I went to bed. An icicle must have got into the works. I can't have slept through a whole day and into another night. He scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. All he could make out that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. He went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and over. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly, and he remembered, on a sudden, that he'd been warned of a visitation when the bell tolled one. A quarter past. Half past. Quarter two. The hour itself and nothing else. But as the bell sounded, light flashed up in the room. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. What has brought you here? Your welfare. Come. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the bed was warm, the thermometer a long way below freezing. He was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, that he had a cold upon him. They passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, but it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. You recollect the way? I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance, 
with its bridge, its church and winding river. Some shaggy ponies were trotting towards them with boys upon their backs who called to other boys in country gigs and carts. All were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. The walls were damp and mossy, the windows broken and the gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. There was an earthy savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. They went across the hall to a door which opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room made barer still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down and wept to see his poor, forgotten self. What is the matter? Nothing. I wish... There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and, waving its hand, said, Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you. He only knew that there he was, alone again. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge turned to the ghost and then glanced anxiously towards the door. Fun! Dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home. Home, Fun? Yes, home. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. He spoke so gently to me one night that I was not afraid to ask if you might come home. And he said yes and sent me to bring you. <laughs> she clapped her hands and laughed and dragged him in her childish eagerness towards the door. When at last his trunk was tied up on the top of the chaise, they bade the schoolmaster goodbye and drove gaily away, the quick wheels dashing the hoarfrost and snow off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. She died, but had, I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, and shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. They went in and at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk, that if he'd been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, and laughed all over himself, and called out, yo ho there! Ebenezer! Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice, Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. 
You hold the boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, the Christmas Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three. Had them up in their places. Four, five, six. Barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine. And came back before you could have got to twelve. Panting like racehorses. Hilly ho, clear away, my lads. Let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick. Shut up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There's nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped on the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright as a ballroom should be. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fizzywig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three 